I was literally scared to hold my own child. Like, I didn't know how to do it right. And I remember talking to a friend of mine who is a dad, because I was worried about that. And he was like, oh, I don't know how you're going to get there. But six months from now, that will not be a concern. Like, the- <laughs> <laughs> Hank Green hit the ground running in his 20s and never really stopped. He and his brother John started their very popular YouTube channel Vlog Brothers in 2007. Since then, Hank's become a science educator, an author, and an entrepreneur. You may have seen him on TikTok acting in his unofficial capacity as the internet science teacher. I first became a fan after seeing his viral video about, and I'm not kidding, Harry Potter. But over the last several years, I've gotten to know Hank as a friend, and we've shared many conversations about life and art, both publicly and privately. He's one of the most thoughtful people I've ever met, and he's not afraid of the big questions. How big is space? Space, as we can see it, does have a size. And that is a sphere that has a diameter of about 93 billion light years. Or the small ones. This is something I need Hank Green's help with. When dogs get into elevators, how do they understand? I've never been a dog, but my guess is that dogs, they're not trying to understand. They're just like, this is the, the room that when the door opens, I'm in a different place. So, of course, I wanted to talk to him about becoming a dad. Hank now lives in Montana with his wife, Catherine, and their six-year-old son, Oren. He's a pro parent now, but before Oren was born, let's just say he was much more comfortable holding a beaker than a baby. I'm Ashley C. Ford, and this is Going Through It, a show about important moments in people's lives and how they navigate them. This season, I'm asking how people figure out whether or not to become parents. In this episode, I'm talking to Hank Green about not just becoming a dad, but feeling like one. Did you ever think about kids growing up? Was that something that was ever on your mind? Well, I was the youngest, and so I never, there wasn't, there wasn't one that showed up in the house. So there wasn't (laughs) that. And I don't think that I really did much. You know, everybody in our neighborhood was kind of the same age. We all grew up together. If there were little kids, we didn't know about them. (laughs) And I feel like I sort of like headed off to college without ever having had any experiences with babies. And that made them pretty scary. This was the late 90s. And so I did have some friends who intentionally uh, were sort of forming their family unit at that age. But it was seemed so alien to me, and it seemed so stigmatized that I like I think that I probably was like afraid of it then. Like I didn't yeah. want to talk to that person as much anymore because they were like doing something that was very outside of how I was imagining my future. Like I had never held a baby before. Right. Like, the first time, like a friend of mine, when I'm like 32 years old, and a friend of mine hands me a baby, and I'm like, I give it, take it back. <laughs> like this thing seems very weird. Like it does not move predictably when I'm holding it. <laughs> what about John's kids? Oh man, John will tell you this terrible story that is true. That the first time I met his son, who was his first kid, mm-hmm. I uh, I held him and I said, "Quote, yep, that's a baby." <laughs> So, like, I was so alienated from the whole, like, human experience of procreation. You know, there was, like, ups and downs in me and Catherine's relationship. So during college, we were together. uh, We were together after college, but we didn't live together. Like, we lived in different places, different Mm -hmm. cities for for some of that time. And then she moved out to Montana, and it was sort of like... I have to figure out how to live in Montana or end this relationship. And then once, like, career things started to happen, that was such a baby on its own. That was so much work, and it was so fun, and it was such an interesting project, and I was doing things with my brother, and I was doing things with Catherine, and that was really rewarding. Yeah. Uh, And taking up a lot of that energy that I did not think— boy, I need something else to put my energy into right now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So with Catherine, how did it 
get to where you were like, yes, this is the person I want to do life with? What was the moment when you were sure about her and you? There were not a lot of conscious decisions made on that path. Yeah. Because it was just sort of like falling down a hill together. And that's great. Uh, that's what I. That's what you want. I do remember pretty specifically in a moment when the relationship was in a really tough spot. Mm-hmm. And figuring out that it was something that I cared about a great deal and really, like, I wanted it. And even I wanted the bad parts and not just, like, I wanted to get back to the part where it was good again. I wanted to do the hard thing that we had to do to get through it and still be together. So it was, like, deciding to do that work. And that was a very conscious decision. Like, I remember, like, sitting in bed and deciding it. Wow. That, like, I want to fight for this thing to be a thing. And, like— I did, and then she did, and we did, and now it's the year 2023. (laughs) You know, it all goes so fast. (laughs) So, Hank, can you tell me about the moment you and Catherine decided we are going to do it? We are going to have a kid. It's a yes. Um, It wasn't like that. No? (laughs) I think that we decided to stop using birth control. Mm Mm-hmm. And see what happens. And see what happens. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And then like a month or two or three and then four and then five went by. And probably month seven, it was like, "Mm, I think we want a baby. Yeah. Um, And then month 12, it was like, "Mm, I think we're going to go see a doctor about the fact that we haven't made a baby yet. Right. And then month 13, there was a baby starting to exist. <laughs> just So it was just like the moment we talked about maybe going to see a doctor, she got pregnant. So yeah, it was a gradual process of realizing that it's what we wanted, which is very us, you know? It's very like, well, you know, I don't see what happens. <laughs> uh, but like there was a decision there to stop taking birth control. Yeah. and um, And that, I think, came down to like, A lot of different factors. There was the fact, like, I think that we wanted something that we were doing together that was, like, our thing. But there was also, like, I think Catherine wanted to sort of be a part of the story of humanity in that way and, like, do a thing that every person in her ancestry who gave birth was a part of and and to have that, you know, that specific experience that, you know, is is like nothing else, obviously. And the cons were like, I don't like puke, and <laughs> I like sleep a lot. And I was right. I mean, I was right about all that stuff. I was absolutely right. The sleep situation, not great, especially early on, very bad. Even now, not great. I get up naturally at like 10 o'clock in the morning, and I'm not going to live that life for a long time. <laughs> it is, it is it, uncomfortable for me. <laughs> And and the the thing that about puke, Oren, he has a disease called cyclical vomiting syndrome. Oh no. That means that he pukes a lot. But the weird thing is like, you know, it, you you just do it. Yeah. You know, like Oren wakes up puking or having already puked and you just like you do it. It's amazing what you can do, honestly. <laughs> like it, it all becomes very doable when um when it's your kid. I would love to get your perspective on something. One of the things that comes up a lot, like when I talk to people about, you know, the decisions or the issues that they're using to decide whether or not to become parents, one of the things that comes up a lot is the climate. Like there are people who are like, I'm not Mm. having a kid. Like, you know, why? Mm. So the sun can burn them up in 50 years or I'm not having a kid because, you know, there's already too many people on the planet. And I was wondering why you did it. Because I'm like, listen, Hank's my science guy, and he knows about climate change. (laughs) And he had a baby. He created a thing that he loves very much to exist inside of the world. Yes, he did. 70 years from now, whatever that looks like. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I... Don't find it convincing. So there, you you identify the two pieces. One is this kid's going to contribute. So like my biggest thing I can do is not make a baby because that baby's going to like consume resources and that's going to increase climate change. And so if it's if it's about personal responsibility, then I shouldn't make a baby even more than I shouldn't drive to Toronto. And 
like that to me, it just doesn't like the the math doesn't pencil out mm-hmm. because if everybody didn't have a baby, then there wouldn't be people anymore. And I'm not trying to save the earth for just the pandas. I'm also trying to save the earth for like jazz and art and ideas and someone to look at the universe and try and figure out when it started and and whether time existed before that. Like people are not the whole point. Like obviously like an, an earth with a bunch of elephants is better than an earth without a bunch of elephants and an earth with a bunch of microbes is better than just rocks. Like, I don't know why that is the case, but, like, that's how I feel. Um, but but I think that an Earth with a bunch of people is better than an Earth without a bunch of people. I think that we're really freaking cool. And I, I kind of want to get to the bottom of that, and I don't really know how to because it's all philosophy, and I'm sure lots of people have had lots of smart thoughts about it already. But I'm I'm not just here for Earth. I'm also here for people. You know, and, and in terms of I'm going to predict the future and imagine that the world is going to be a catastrophe – and I don't want to bring a person into that. I just, like, yeah, I don't think that, like, having a kid is about fear. I think it's about hope. And I think mm-hmm. that, like, no one has ever been any good at predicting the future. You know, we're better now than ever. And, like, so we can tell that the Earth is going to be warmer if nothing changes. We know that that's going to have a lot of implications. But even more specifically, I think that just like every other big problem— It is more about how it will affect people unjustly than how it will affect people in total. Mm -hmm. And I think that there should be people thinking about that and solving those problems. And you can't do that without people. We'll be right back. So tell me about being a new dad. I mean, they hand you this kid. They definitely make you take it home. You (laughs) take it to your house. And now this is their house, too. And you're Mm -hmm. a dad. Like, what's going on there inside? Yeah, I mean, there is a very weird otherworldly part of being like, I got a roommate, and he is weird. (laughs) But, yeah, I mean, I felt a pretty good bond immediately where it was like I saw him with Catherine and that like triggered something in me that was like this is my family but like there was still a fair bit of alienation between me and the baby for a while where it was like a little bit you're a task yeah (laughs) more than a human until the like laughing and smiling started and then it was like some kind of dad thing kicked in where it was more like, this is my child. Yeah. Um, and I think that that happens at different times for different people, but I was lucky to get some people who said to me, don't feel bad if you don't feel a lot kind of thing. Like, if your body doesn't know what to do with this, if your mind doesn't know what to do with this, that's okay. Right. That makes so much sense. So as your mind starts to know what to do with this, When did you get to a point where you felt like you were really good at parenting? Yeah, I mean, I was literally scared to hold my own child. Like, I didn't know how to do it right. And I remember talking to a friend of mine who is a dad, because I was worried about that. And he was like, oh, I don't know how you're going to get there, but six months from now, that will not be a concern. Like, (laughs) (laughs) Which is, it's like, Oren is learning how to ice skate right now. And a a very dad thing that I say to him when he's having a hard time with it is, the only thing that matters is time on the ice. Like, you'll get better if you spend more time on the ice. You won't get better if you don't spend more time on the ice. It's just time on the ice, bud. I mean, the number of times I've said time on the ice, send me to dad jail. Um, But that's that's the case with, with parenting. Like, it's really about time. It's really about spending the time picking the kid up, holding the kid, wrestling with the kid, learning about the kid, spending time watching YouTube videos with the kid. Like, all of it, it's just time on the ice. So you're clearly a pro now. <laughs> you spend all that time on the ice. So when are the moments 
when you feel most like a dad? I think that because, you know, the experience to some extent has been falling down the hill, sort of like doing what feels natural and not really thinking about that in the the context of what I had formerly had in my mind as the picture of of being a dad. Right. That when I'm doing stuff with Oren, I don't necessarily feel super dad-like. And the first time I really, like, looked at myself and I was like, oh, wow, what a dad. You know, it wasn't like I'm out there in the shop with my drill and it wasn't <laughs> a dad joke. Um, it was like I was over at a friend's house and there was a bunch of kids and they were all boys. And the adults were all inside and the kids had some issue. And I went out and I was, like, solving the issue with all of the kids. Everybody else stayed inside. They were, like – hanging out, drinking wine, making dinner. And like I did this. And then after like we sort of worked through it, we all played. And like I played with all of them, just piling on me and just jumping around and goofing off. And it felt so I was like, this, okay, this is this is the good stuff. This is amazing. And I know like I feel like I should be in this situation. I'm helping my friends by like taking care of the kids a little bit. And I also feel like I'm good at it. You know, I feel like I'm good at this and I'm having a, a good time doing it. And it's it's a service to, like, everybody all at once. To me, to them, and to my friends all at once. I love that. That's a role I play a lot with friend gatherings with yeah. the kids. Not just because in a lot of cases I love my friends, but their kids are cooler in a lot of cases. They just, <laughs> just are. Their interests are more interesting. They're like, do you want to talk about space? Of and I'm like, I, I do. do. I want to talk about space. I don't want to talk about enrollment <laughs> at the preschool. Hank, thank you so much for your time, for answering these questions. Oh, thanks so much. I appreciate you outsourcing your uh, decision-making onto the whole world I <laughs> with should. a podcast. It's important. <laughs> I'm going to take a poll at uh -huh. the end. That'll be great. And let, however let everybody vote, else decide. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way it's going to get done. And we're yeah. waiting for me to make a decision. No way. Never going to happen. Got to fall down the hill. Yeah. <laughs> the Hank Green method. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I definitely ended this conversation with more hope for the world than I had before, but also a few more questions for myself. When it comes to being someone's parent, I definitely trust myself to make it through the hard parts. But am I excited about the hard parts too? If it's not clear yet, I'm someone who doesn't make decisions easily. So it's liberating to imagine just falling down a hill. The next question is whether the hill I fall down goes toward parenthood or away from it. Going Through It is a production of Pineapple Street Studios and MailChimp. Our producer is Emerald O'Brien. Our associate producers are Marina Hankey and Yinka Rickford Anguin. Our managing producer is Camila Kashani. The show is edited by Aaron Edwards. Mixing by Davy Sumner. Original music by Mike Noyce and Davy Sumner with additional music from Epidemic Sound. Mara Davis is our booker. We had help from Stephen Key, Jason Richards, and Ari Saperstein. Legal services for Pineapple Street by Bianca Grimshaw at Granderson de Roche. Our executive producer is J.N. Berry. Our production partners at MailChimp Studios are Julie Douglas, Sasha Brown, Christina Humphrey, and Caroline Albro. And a special thanks to my better half, without whom none of this would be possible. My assistant, Ariane Young. And thank you for listening. We know the range of experiences around this decision is so broad. And while we can't cover every story, we're grateful that we could bring you a few of them.